This is flipped lecture number 44, and it's the last flipped lecture. And uh, I don't want to make a huge deal about it because we're going to get to see each other in coming years. And I'm here to help you later on, even if you're not taking classes from me. But um, it's been a pleasure having you. And uh, we've covered a lot. Sorry, it's been so much. Uh, that is what we have to cover. And now we're on the last topic. And the last topic is something called superposition. The material on superposition uh, actually is got quite a few sections in chapter 17. We're only going to cover 17.1, 17.2, and 17.3. 17.1 is first, what is superposition? Well, superposition is pretty simple. It says that if you have a solution of a wave equation, okay, so you have some solution of the wave equation that may be like f of x and t that solves an equation like uh, d of x and t, the displacement, say, of a string is a function of the position along the string, and at a certain time, maybe you found something that works. And actually, we know what kinds of things work. One kind of thing that works is right moving waves. That would be like uh, f of x minus vt works. And another thing that works is left moving waves. So we could call that uh, fr. We could call this fl of x plus vt. Those things work. And some other things that uh, are special cases of that are like sinusoidal waves. So we know what kinds of things uh, actually work here, but it doesn't really matter too much what they are. Suppose we have another solution of the wave equation. So I'll call this one d1 of x and t, and I'll say I have another solution, d2 of x and t, which is g of x and t. The principle of superposition is just that if this is the solution of the wave equation, and this is a solution of the wave equation, then this is also a solution of the wave equation. One kind of interesting consequence is that if you have a wave, let's say that's just some kind of nice little bump, and it's moving to the right, and you have another wave that's some kind of little bump, maybe some other shape bump, and it's moving to the left, then these two pass right through each other without affecting each other. So one consequence of the principle of superposition is that if this thing can go to the left with nothing going on over here, and this thing can go to the right with nothing going on over there, then this thing can go to the right while this thing goes to the left, and they can pass right through each other. Let's look at that in some specific examples, okay? So let's suppose we have two waves that have the same frequency and the same wavelength. So I'm going to have two waves that have the same frequency and the same wavelength, except they're moving in opposite directions. And I'm only going to give them the same amplitude. So let f of x and t equal a sine kx minus omega t. And let g of x and t equal a sine of kx plus omega t. Well, by the principle of superposition, f of x and t plus g of x and t is also a solution of the wave equation. And f of x and t and g of x and t, well, they both have a's in them. So we've got an a out front here. And they have sine of kx minus omega t plus sine of kx plus omega t. Now you know what I'm going to do next. I'm going to throw trig identities at this. There, I did it for you. I applied a trig identity for the sine of something minus something, and another trig identity for the sine of something plus something. I applied those two trig identities, and I wrote out what they are up there. And now you see that two of these terms cancel off of each other. The minus coax sine omega t, 
and the plus cos kx sine omega t, those cancel. And these two just add. So I get plus 2a sine kx cosine omega t. Now this is kind of interesting. This is the subject of 17.2, and it's called a standing wave. Because what you'll see here is that you have some function of time multiplied by some function of position. And what that means, let's look at this thing at t equals 0. At t equals 0, we just have 2a sine kx. Well, that means we go, the sum of these two waves goes all the way up to 2a and all the way down to minus 2a. So in other words, the sum of these two waves can get as big as twice the sum of either of them. And that's what it looks like at t equals 0. Because at t equals 0, cosine omega t is 1. It's just 2a sine kx. Now let's look at this a little bit of time later. Like suppose just a little bit of time has gone on and now cos omega t has gotten a little less than its maximum value of 1. Maybe cos omega t has gotten down to 0 0.8, okay? Uh, you can compute whatever uh, omega t would have to be to bring cos omega t down to 0 0.8. It's the arc cosine of 0 0.8. Now you have a value for omega t. Anyway, you wait that long, cosine gets to be a little smaller. That means that you still have the same original function, 2a sine kx, but now it's multiplied by 0 0.8. So that means you got the same exact function, except it doesn't go quite as high or quite as low. And now we wait a little longer. Wait a little longer, maybe cos omega t is now down to 0 0.6. Well, now this thing is just a little more than half of its original height. So it looks like this. Then maybe we wait till cosine omega t is 0 0.4. So now this thing is a little less than half of its original height. Now it looks like that. And then we wait till it's 0, cos omega t has gotten all the way down to 0 0.2. Okay, so now it's even a little less than half of its that it's even a little smaller. And then finally, you wait till the right time, cosine omega t could get all the way to be nothing. In which case, this thing is dead flat. There is not, at that particular moment in time, uh, doesn't matter what 2a sine kx is, if cos omega t is zero, then this entire thing is flat. And so a standing wave is this idea that the thing goes up and down in certain points, but it doesn't really seem to be traveling left or right. And the amusing thing was, is it turns out that the standing wave is this function sum of a, that was a right moving wave, and this was a left moving wave. Now, uh, just to round things out a little bit, you might be wondering, when does cos omega t get to be zero? Well, that's when omega t is equal to pi over two, or when t equals pi over 2 omega. Now, t equals pi over 2 omega, since omega is equal to 2 pi f, but f is equal to 1 over t, so this is equal to 2 pi over t. This, is, this thing becomes 0 when t is pi over 2 over 2 pi over omega. Uh, I stuck in that t equals pi over 2 omega from putting in omega t equals pi over 2, and then I used that omega is 2 pi over t, where t is the period, and we discovered that this thing gets to be 0 when t is equal to capital T over 4. And it's also 0 again when uh, t is... 3t over 4, and it's 0 again when t is 5t over 4, and it's 0 again when t is 7t over 4, etc., etc., etc. Every half a period, this thing becomes 0 again. Then it goes, then it becomes, after a, after a half a period, it actually goes negative. The, 
and we have something that looks like that and it gets to its most most negative value like it looks like that and then it starts to decline again and after a whole period you're back to the original shape now I want to say a couple things about this before I uh, erase it and do a little bit more stuff this point here which is always zero that's called a node this point over here, which is always zero, is called a node. And those points occur when kx is some multiple of pi. And these points here where the thing is most wildly oscillating are halfway in between those. So this is where the nodes are at. It's the values of x such that kx equals n pi. These things here are called antinodes, and the location of the antinodes are when kx is halfway in between those, which we write as n plus a half pi. So you can solve those for x, or and sometimes the problem is given in, in terms of the positions of the nodes, in which case you could find k. Now you should compare these formulas with 17.8, 17.9, and 17.10 in night. Uh, the only thing he adds to it that I haven't already done for you here, is he takes k and he sets k equal to 2 pi over lambda, and then he learns a little bit more about the positions x uh, after doing that. So now I'm going to go on to 17.3. Because you have all this at your disposal now, let's do something more with it. So this is a section about waves on a string. And if you have a string, uh, Knight equation 16.1 was that the velocity of waves in the string was equal to the mass per unit length of the string and uh, the tension of the string, string, like that, square root of t over mu. And so uh, if we say that you have a wave on a string that's sine kx minus omega t, you already know then that omega over k must equal v, and there's your formula for v. That's for a right moving wave. And of course, for a left moving wave, you have uh, another sine kx plus omega t. Now, a very common situation, and one which you've dealt with in lab already, or will deal with in lab very soon, is a situation where a string is clamped to something at both ends. So there's a string and it's clamped at one end and clamped another end, and it can do whatever it likes in between. But the important thing is, is it can't move here and it can't move there. Now, we already know, thanks to what we just covered, we know a way of finding a solution of the wave equation, which is zero here and zero here. Let's put the origin of the coordinates, the x-coordinate, Let's put the origin of the x coordinate at one of the walls. Well, then we know that a left moving wave plus a right moving wave uh, gives us something that is a standing wave. And the formula for that standing wave was, now this is certainly zero at this wall. So we've already satisfied the fact that it's clamped at that at that position it is clear if it's clamped right here it's not moving up and down right there near to the wall it can start moving up and down but right at the wall it's not moving up and down a lot so a question though arises is uh, under what circumstances is it also not moving over here well what we need if I draw this a little bit more accurately is I need a certain number of wavelengths to fit between these two walls. And if exactly an even number of wavelengths, for example, here's two whole wavelengths, fits between the two walls, then if I'm zero at this wall, I'll be also be zero at that wall. Actually, some other cases work too. It doesn't just have to be an even number. It can be like one half of a wavelength, or it can be one and a half wavelengths. So any multiple of a half of a wavelength works, even multiples and odd multiples. Now let me say that over and a little slower because it is the, actually the main idea of section 
and I'll make sure you understand it. So we found this as a standing wave solution. Well, clearly when we put in x equals zero, it satisfies the clamped boundary condition at x equals zero. Now we want it to also satisfy the clamped boundary condition when you get to the x position of L, which is where the other clamp is. So we put in x equals L here into this equation, and we want this to sign of that to be zero. Well, the way you make sine of that into e be zero is you set k times l equals to any multiple of pi. Okay, then I just use this other formula over here, which I have, which is the relationship between k and lambda. I stick 2 pi over lambda right there where you see k. Then I cancel off the pi's and multiply through by lambda. Then I divide through by the integer m. Now this is the way physicists usually write it, but here's another way of saying it. Here is the case of, to help you flesh that out, here is the case with m equals 3. 2l over 3, lambda here is 2l over 3. Let's graph this function for all the way, instead of graphing it just to L, let's graph it all the way out to 2L. So there it's repeated. It's gone up, down, up, and then down, up, down, and we're now all the way out at 2L. What this says is that in a space 2L, we've gone three wavelengths. So that was just to help you see it. This is the case of this or this with m equals 3. I'll show you another case. Here's the case with m equals 4. And here's another case. Here's the case with m equals 1. Here's a case with m equals 2. Let's double check that last case, and that's where I'm going to leave it. I'm going to put m equals 2 into this formula. I got that lambda equals L. So what we've discovered is we now know how to manufacture solutions of the waves on a string out of standing wave solutions. We do it by choosing our k's very carefully. And by the way, once you've chosen the k's, since we know the relationship between omega uh, k and v, that also tells you the frequencies. So we choose the k's very carefully, which forces us to choose the frequencies very carefully. And now we have solutions of a wave on a string where the string is clamped at both ends. You now understand the main ideas of 17.1, superposition, 17.2, standing waves, 17.3, how you get standing waves to satisfy clamped boundary conditions. In class on Thursday, we'll play with this stuff so that these uh, boundary conditions, hopefully with a little more practice, um, become a little more familiar to you. And then on the very last day, we'll see if we can get the computer to do some of the hard work that we did to solve the 70 rod, 75 rod situation, uh, which we did pretty gorily on Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Bye.